thank you all for attending the 36 Word Runoff Forum, sponsored by the Belmont Slayer Community Organization. My name is Alonso Zaragoza, and I will be your moderator for the evening. Special thanks to Pastor Floyd from the Narragansett Church of God for allowing us to do this church tonight. I would also like to thank Omar Aquino and Gilbert Villegas for participating in the forum, and for our timekeeper, Jorge Felix from the Hermosa Community Network, um, for helping us out with this event tonight. I will now introduce you to Pastor Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Pastor Floyd, Gorman R. Floyd, and I want to thank y'all for coming out to Mary and the Church of God. Make yourselves at home. One thing I want to say to you. I'm out of breath, I just ran down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I want to say to you, we want a friendly debate, no arguing. We are in the house of God, amen? amen. We want to keep it the cheering to a minimum because we want to ask as many questions as we can, amen? And we want to do it in a respectful, and uh, we still want to have a little debate going on. I don't want to take away the debate, but I want it to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, tell you some things about the Narragansett Church of God. We have a lot of things that we try to do for the community. We have uh, movie nights every fourth Sunday in, in the month where we will come in here and put a movie on the projector to help the community out. We have a food drive, we have a clothes drive, and we have a teen room that we do what we call real talk with teens. That's when you sit down with the teens and ask them what, how to bridge the gap between teens and adults. If anybody got any kids, you know how, what I mean. Nobody glad. Nobody got kids? Okay, there we go. <laughs> so I just want to introduce myself, and I'm so happy to have these two candidates here. And if anything we can do to help you, just let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Each candidate will now be given up to three minutes to introduce themselves, and then we will go on to the questions. Our timekeeper, Jorge, in front of you, will hold up a yellow card to let you know that you have 30 seconds left to speak, and a red card to show you that you have 15 seconds left. When you hear the word stop, your time is up. We'll start with Omar. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Omar Kino, candidate for Alderman and obviously 36 Ward here. I just want to first and foremost thank everyone for being here, uh, taking time out of your day to listen to Gilbert and I and our differing opinions of how to move not only the 36th Ward forward, but the, the city of Chicago. And so I want to uh, especially thank the church here for hosting the Narragansett Church of God. Pastor Floyd, thank you again. Uh, and then the Belmont Clare Community Organization, Alonzo Zaragoza, thank you so much for putting this on. Uh, Jorge Felix for helping today. And all others that helped in some way get the, the word out there and try to inform our neighbors of, of this great discussion that we're going to have tonight. Um, my name again is Omar Aquino. I'm, I'm uh, born and raised on the northwest side here in the city of Chicago, actually very close to this community. My godparents actually live just a, a block away on Nave on the 2200 block, so I'm familiar with this community. Um, I'm running for alderman because I was a, I spent my entire career in public servitude. I a pu consider myself a public servant. And quite simply, what you're here for is to hear my ideas and my platform. So my platform is simple. Um, I believe we need better city services for a world-class city that we, we are in. Chicago is a world-class city and we deserve the services uh, of such a city. And so in terms of education, I'm a product of Chicago Public Schools. I actually first attended, uh, not too far away from here, Mary Lyon School, and then transferred over to uh, Sarah Language Academy. And that's where I graduated from, from elementary school, and then I went to Lincoln Park High School. And so I'm, I'm for an elected school board. I'm, I'm for having professional educators teach our, uh, our students and our, and our kids in the, in the community. Um, I am proposing, if, once I get in, in, if elected, uh, I will propose a moratorium on, on opening new charter schools in, in, in the Chicago area, land area, or in Chicago rather. Um, I'm for reasonable class sizes. And, um, and beyond that, in terms of public safety, it's a, it's a big issue. Just recently here, we had a, um, a, uh, someone who was shot um, in the 36th Ward since the beginning of the year, we had two deaths of uh, young teens, a 13-year-old nearby, and a 16-year-old on the northern portion of the, 
of, uh, of the ward. So it's a great concern of the public safety, not only citywide, but here locally in 36 Ward. And so I'm, I'm for having more police officers. However, that doesn't solve all our issues. So I, and I believe that we need more after school programming at our schools and at our parks. Uh, we need year-round employment service, uh, employment opportunities for our teenagers. Um, but yet, the biggest issue in our city is the city budget that's impacted by the public pension liability that we currently have. And so if we don't attack that and try to generate re uh, reasonable uh, revenue uh, in a fair and balanced way, we cannot provide the services that we all deserve. And so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I hope to earn your support and I hope to have your support on April 7th. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gilbert Villegas. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. I want to thank Alonzo for moderating, Pastor Floyd for allowing us to use your facility in the 36th Ward. Um, I think that this race, the 36th Ward, is a very interesting race in that the 31st Ward had, had, has garnered a lot of the attention, but finally the Chicago Tribune has highlighted and kind of put in context what the 36th Ward race is all about. And so if you allow me, I'll read a quick uh, paragraph uh, from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, on 36th Ward, and this Northwest Side race is a political junkie's delight. Cook County Assessor Joe Berrios, stunned by the defeat of his daughter, former Rep Tony Berrios in the 2014 Illinois House race, is trying to defend his political base here. He's backing Omar Aquino, who once worked for Tony Berrios. Aquino would need a crash course in everything. Gilbert Villegas, a business consultant and former Marine, has the backing of his representative Luis Gutierrez and Cook County Commissioner Jesus Garcia. There's just no comparison. Villegas has held high positions at the Illinois, Cap Illinois Department of Transportation and the Illinois Capital Development Board and is far better prepared for the job. He makes a good argument that he would encourage neighborhood business development and Villegas is strongly endorsed. So that's the Chicago Tribune's word saying that that I'm strongly endorsed based on my experience. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, uh, a teamster for 10 years where I fought to make sure that drivers and dock workers, their contracts were being adhered to. Uh, after 10 years with the Teamsters, I was uh, appointed as a deputy director with the Illinois Department of Transportation where I oversaw over 1.5 billion in, in capital construction projects and made sure that minority and women-owned businesses were participating on publicly funded contracts. After five years, I was uh, recruited to the Hispanic American Construction Industry Association, a trade association where I represented over 300 companies, and passed two pieces of legislation that ultimately became law that leveled the playing field, once again, for minority and women-owned businesses. After three years with ASEA, I was appointed to be the chief of staff at the Capital Development Board, where, once again, I oversaw 140 people and a $3.9 billion capital program. So when we're talking about experience, when we're talking about moving the 36th Ward forward, I've got that experience. And that's why I'm here today to talk about my experience and talk about my vision. Public safety is my number one issue. And that's why the Controller Order of Police has endorsed my candidacy. And that's why the Chicago Tribune said that I'll be tough on crime. Again, I have a community policing plan. I plan to use my office as a conduit for the community and the police department. We need to form a partnership. We need to build that trust between the community and the police department. Thank you. There have been at least five reported shootings within three blocks of this church in the last two months. Both candidates want safe streets and want to hire more police. But what specific steps are you going to take as aldermen to improve safety in the community? Gilbert? Followed by Omar, you have two minutes to answer the question. Again, public safety is my number one issue. Uh, I have a community policing plan. I have a plan, community policing plan, and that's why the Fraternal Order of Police, as well as the Chicago Tribune, has said that I'm going to be tough on crime because I plan to use my office, my office as a conduit between the community and the police department. What's going on? What's going on out there is that there's a lot of kids, a lot of youth that just don't have any activities. I plan to take a look at the property that's located on Fullerton by Hanson Park, convert that into a community center. It's strategically located right between Hanson Park, Vehicle, Cross Vocational, and I plan to use 
that facility to develop uh, uh, programs for these young kids that are just don't have any activities. My office, again, is gonna be very proactive in making sure that we build that trust within the community and the police department. It's very sad to see all these fatalities and these shootings going on in this community, but it's because of the lack of jobs, the lack of activities for these kids, and so we need to get a lot more aggressive, and I plan on working with the community to develop these programs, and again, working with the police department. Community, um, excuse me, criminal justice is what I have a background in. That's what I graduated with a uh, bachelor's, one of my, my degrees from, from Loyola University. And so in terms of public safety, it is a, is a, a great concern, not only in the city, but also in the, uh, the 36th Ward on the Northwest side. Uh, our, our boundaries or our communities um, don't save anyone from, uh, from crime. And so I was endorsed by Sheriff uh, Tom Dart and Gun Violence Prevention Pact because of my plans. I do want to have a true community policing uh, available um, both in the 25th district and the 16th, and I'll be working with, uh, with local commanders to make sure that our communities are safe. I, uh, like I said initially, I'm a proponent for hiring more police officers. I believe we at minimum need 500 more police officers uh, on our streets to make sure that we have safer streets. However, I know that that's not the only solution. We certainly, we can't work on any of these issues in silos, because we, we just don't, we can't. Um, education, um, economic development, all these other issues impact our, our public safety. And so we need to make sure that we have uh, great opportunities for businesses to come in here and, and have safe streets. Uh, and the way you do that is working on all these issues. So in terms of economic development, I want to make sure that we have uh, year-round jobs uh, that are provided to teenagers so that we can encourage them to become uh, um, pain, uh, 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 serviceable in, uh, citizens in our, in our communities. And uh, after school programs at our schools and parks, where we need parks and schools that have the adequate funding to provide these things. And so, again, I am, um, I believe that our, in terms of public safety, we have to work not only necessarily with hiring more police officers, but also on, on the other issues of economic development and our education. Thank you. Again, I will inform you that this is not a uh, county forum to support your candidate. It's an informational one. Please hold your applause until the end of the forum so we can get to as most questions as, as possible. The 36 Ward needs a 24-7 alderman. Will you have any outside jobs aside from aldermen? Where will your aldermanic service office be, be at? What will be the operating hours of the office? How many ward nights will you have? Will your employees all be residents of the 36th ward? How will you choose the employees? Two minutes, Omar. Uh, those were a lot of questions in one, so I'll try to try to uh, get through all of them. But quite simply, uh, I'm going to be a full-time alderman. Uh, there's no questions about that. I'm currently a full-time candidate because I believe that what the people of the 36th ward need are someone that's going to be there. Uh, without question, here in the city of Chicago, here in the 36th Ward, that is available uh, presence. And so our office, our, our campaign office is currently at 6325 West Belmont, which is on Belmont and Narragansett. We'd like to keep that there. Um, our, I certainly, once uh, if elected, would be looking to hire uh, residents of the 36th Ward to serve the communities. A lot of people within our ward don't under, still don't know that there are changes that happen with the maps and whatnot. So we want people that understand our communities, that understand the changes and the impact that it has on their neighbors. Um, and I, I apologize, Alonzo, you're gonna have to go through a few of those uh, questions. How many more ward nights would you have? Okay, uh, in terms of, uh, like, do you mind if you just repeat them and I'll answer them one at a time. Uh, okay. In terms of ward nights, we certainly will have at, at bare minimum one ward night a week. But more than importantly, I think in terms of what you what people want as a representative, as their alderman, it's someone that's open and accessible. So we would obviously have uh, means of communication uh, with social media and so forth. But I think the, the best way, and I've seen it on, um, and I've spoke to neighbors about this, is that it's nothing like when you have an elected official that's coming to your door, not when it's time for, for, uh, to gain their uh, political advantage and, and, and try to earn their support to get their vote. But more importantly, have somebody there that's committed to knocking on doors all the time. And so I will be doing that. 
uh, because I think it's a lot better to talk, have a conversation at someone's door and talk about the, uh, the issues on, in their community and on their block presently and not necessarily just uh, um, over email or any other things like that. Would you have any outside job aside from Alderman? Where will your Aldermanic Service Office be at? What will be the operating hours of the office? How many ward nights will you have? Will your employees all be residents of the 36 ward? How will you choose the employees? Okay. So yes, I'm gonna be a full-time Alderman. Uh, campaigning full-time right now as well. Uh, my office, if elected, will be at the, by the Brickyard. I think that the Brickyard is uh, strategically located if you look where the how the map is drawn, it's like a horseshoe or a U, and so the uh, it makes sense to uh, put it as close uh, to the middle as possible. And plus, it, it Brickyard is a, a nice big, a nice landmark that everyone's kind of familiar with. And I always joke that uh, afterwards, you can, after you come see me, you just go over to Target and, and purchase some of your goods for the for the week. Um, I'll be having uh, ward nights at least one night uh, a week. Um, our hours will be uh, the traditional hours of nine to five. On ward night, it will be a little bit later. Um, how I plan to hire my employees, uh, I'm looking for the most professional employees. Customer service is gonna be my number one issue. I wanna make sure that the constituents, the taxpayers, uh, when they're coming to their office, that they're treated professionally. Uh, and I will be looking for residents from all over the 36 ward to apply for these positions as well as uh, looking for uh, some nice young talent that's coming from college uh, with some technical and IT skills so that way again we can take a look at um, some virtual office hours and other things that use technology to our advantage. Um, how will I choose my employees? I will uh, put ads out there and interview them and make sure that again uh, there's, they're not related to me, uh, no nepotism. Uh, oh, I also plan to have a rotating ward night uh, where once a month um, the ward office will will go to the precincts, uh, the neighboring precincts, and then we would deal with those issues specifically. I'll bring the commissioner, uh, whatever commissioner it is that uh, we're having a lot of problems with in that department, bring them out there so that way they can hear uh, clearly right from the constituents what the issues are, and they can give us a uh, resolution. Thank you. The south end of the 36th ward needs a strong public library. The nearest one is Hidden Oriana Park, small and underfunded, and is not comparable, comparable to libraries in other communities. As Alderman, what do you plan to do to make sure that all of our residents have access to a strong and local public library? One minute, go do it. So as it relates to the uh, libraries, uh, that's actually, those, those are actually built under what's called the Public Building Commission. And so that's a separate entity and uh, Given my, my familiarity with uh, the Public Building Commission, uh, I'll take a look and work with the executive director there to find out what their long-term plan is as it relates to what our libraries. Uh, but I'm a big proponent of making sure that we do, we do have these facilities and that they're not just used uh, during regular hours, that they're, they're, these buildings are utilized for other types of activities uh, just besides the, uh, the library. I look at it more as a community center and I wanna make sure that these children that are going there to study but there's also some other programs there, uh, maybe some senior programs there as well. But definitely, uh, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of, of uh, making sure that we do have these new facilities and I'll be working closely with the Public Building Commission. So I live in the southern portion of, of this ward and I agree with you, Alonzo, as we are neighbors, that there's certainly a uh, need for, for public li a new public library down in the southern portion of the 36. There's also a need in the Galewood community as well as uh, what used to be a public library there is now in the basement of a uh, Cedar Park. And so these are things that are needed throughout the entire 36 ward. Uh, in addition to that, I would look to try to get uh, a public space, a public library community center in the 36 ward. Um, I believe that, like I said, in terms of after school programs, we need them both at our parks, at our schools, and um, uh, public spaces like community center. Uh, but beyond that, we also need uh, improvements, not only to bring in dollars for a new public library, but improvements of those facilities that are already existing in our communities, uh, such as our parks, where uh, if you looked at the 36th Ward, our parks are suffering um, all throughout, in the north and the southern and western area. We need to make sure that we're getting adequate funding, not only public uh, money, but also private uh, uh, grants and things like that to get some money into our uh, board. Thank you. We have a 
problem with illegal parking in the alley, illegal conversion of single family homes, and loud music playing at all hours of the night in our ward. As Alderman, what specific actions are you gonna take to address those three issues? In two minutes, we'll start with Omar. And again, it's Alonzo, I apologize because it's a multi-question, but illegal parking, illegal conversions, and- uh, Loud music. And loud music. So um, in terms of illegal parking and illegal conversions, what you would want, what I believe that the role as an alderman's uh, office is you have your staff there, specifically, especially with streets and sanitation, you have a superintendent that can go and make sure that in terms of illegal parking and conversions, uh, those, those things are reported to the, the necessary departments, especially with the legal conversion, I'll talk with the, the building department and so forth. Um, in terms of loud music, I mean, we really have to have a sort of community approach at this, not necessarily only getting uh, the police department involved, but you have to actively get out there as an alderman and sometimes mediate some of these issues because we live in a community and so we live with neighbors. Um, and we don't want our first response to just call 911 and you have neighbors that are, are literally fighting with neighbors. So I think you have to have, 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 you have, to have a hands-on approach not only as alderman yourself, but also have a staff and a and a um, an office that is available to sort of mediate some of these problems. But in, uh, again, back to the parking and conversion issue, we want to make sure that we're dealing with the appropriate departments uh, within the city and holding them accountable, making sure that we're resolving these issues in our ward. As it relates to uh, the illegal parking, uh, obviously that would be an issue for the police department. Uh, if the police department's not handling that issue, then our office will step in and uh, put a little friendly call into the commander, let him know that that issue is becoming my issue and so the result is gonna be his issue to resolve. As it relates to the illegal conversions, that's something where I would get the, uh, the, department, the building department uh, to take a look at maybe some violations. Uh, again, making sure that the Chicago Fire Department is taking a look at it as well for safety. Again, those are public safety issues that we need to make sure um, uh, these renters that would be in these facilities are, are safe. Um, loud music, um, again, if it's just a matter of uh, you know calling our office if, if it's uh, if it's late at night. Uh, probably um, shooting, shooting an email to our virtual office. Our office will go ahead and in turn contact the police department if you know the neighbors don't want to get involved and have any disputes. Um, but again, I, I think that uh, friendly conversation uh, from the alderman's office to the constituents, letting them know that they need to be courteous. Uh, and respect their neighbors, I think, would go a long way. Again, our office is gonna be very active in making sure that the lines of communication are open from my office to the, to the uh, community, and uh, we're gonna have some professional staff there that'll be able to address these issues. We have a serious lack of opportunities for our young adults in the ward. There are few jobs available, no community centers for them to use in the ward, and the parks and schools offer very little programming for them, and never in the evening. What specific plans do we have to make sure that young adults have something to do in the ward as a productive alternative to being on the streets? Two minutes, go over. Okay, so as it relates to parks, uh, I'm on the Chabon Park Advisory Council and we were very successful last year in bringing a new playground. I'm also on the Bell Park Advisory Council where this year you, you drive down Oak Park, you'll see that there's already construction going on for, for a brand new playground. Um, and that's something that, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a dad with two boys, I like to see my sons, especially my seven-year-old, playing out in the playground, and especially one that's, that didn't have an F rating. Uh, and that's why I got really involved in the park advisory councils. Um, as relates to the opportunities, I've already been in discussion with the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce, as well as World Business Chicago, to find out what types of companies are actually thinking about expanding. Uh, and then Chicago Land Chamber, making sure, talking to them to find out the corporate the corporations that may have some summer turn internships, some summer summer internships, is whether they're paid or not paid. Uh, I'm gonna plan. I plan to take a look at bringing on some interns into my office, uh, probably unpaid because of our budget. Um, but nevertheless, we want to make sure that these these uh, these young uh, men and women have opportunities that are exposed uh, to the workforce. So again, as a small business owner, I understand that uh, uh, we got to give the we got to train these youth and. and get them some experience uh, in the corporate world. Uh, and so again, like I said, I've been working closely with the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce to take a look at some of the opportunities that will be coming up uh, in 2015. Well, this is exactly what I was uh, referring to earlier in terms of my platform. 
Um, you know, I think we need year-round employment opportunities for teens. Uh, there's a program out in LA that was started in the late 80s, early 90s, called uh, Homeboys Bakery. It ended up becoming Homeboys Industries. And essentially, their theme is nothing stops a bullet quite like a job. And I agree uh, full, full, fully with that. Um, it, we want productive alternatives to games, essentially. And giving uh, uh, young teens and, and young kids an opportunity to 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 gain um, uh, some to gain uh, leadership roles and whatnot within our own community. So what I would do specifically is I would reach out to our local chambers and our local businesses and work with to try to find if there's some opportunities within their businesses, either small, medium sized, or large businesses within the 36. We have lots of, of role, um, and see if there's opportunities for uh, for our teenagers, especially when we have the different high schools here in, in the 36 ward. And so we want to be able to provide them jobs, uh, first and foremost. Uh, community centers. We absolutely do not have community centers here in the 36 ward. Uh, I think we need uh, better funding for either community centers, our parks, and our schools so that we can have after school programs. Um, but I believe you can take a look at Haas Park. It's a, Haas Park is a park in, on Fullerton just east of California. And what they did was they did public-private partnerships in order to bring funding to, to, to their park. And so well, that's exactly what we would want to do is if the city or the state or the county doesn't have the adequate funding to you know, provide us these resources to have these, these, um, these, these to help our community grow, we want to reach out and see if there's any private grants available that we can make sure that we're bringing in those dollars and have it public dollars and private dollars to make sure that we have those community centers, those adequate services for our parks and so forth. Rumor has it that a number of charter proposals are gonna be brought up for the Northwest side. Aside from being in favor of a charter school moratorium, which you both are, will you actively resist and fight against all additional charter schools from coming into the 36th ward? One minute, Omar. Uh, yes. Uh, simply, I believe that, so I have no sort of qualm with charter schools itself. It, it, it's, it's, my issue with charter schools is, it's not about the, the difference between choice, it's that we have public money that's going to a private entity to, to run schools, that those private entities aren't interested in making sure that we have professional educators in, in our schools. So I am a, I'm proposing a moratorium in the city um, of, for charter schools. I'd like to make sure that we have teachers that are, are unionized that have um, the ability to, to, to join a union, that we have professional educators uh, that are teaching uh, students and not just someone out of college that you know did anything. They need an education, uh, they need to have a background in education to be able to teach our kids. Rumor has it that a number of charter school proposals are gonna be brought up for the Northwest side. Aside from being in favor of a charter school moratorium, which you both are, will you actively resist and fight against all additional <coughs> charter schools from coming into the 36th ward? The short answer is yes. As it relates to charter schools, the way that they're set up, um, we need to take a look at changing some legislation down in Springfield. Um, they're for-profit entities. We need to change them to not-for-profit entities. We need to make sure that, again, we're focusing on the students, the parents, and the teachers. The students getting a great education, the parents realizing that the kids are getting a good, ed good education, and teachers making sure they have the right to collectively bargain. So yes, I am will definitely resist and fight for neighborhood schools and make sure that uh, these public dollars are being spent correctly. Both of your campaigns have received thousands of dollars from the same developers that have made neighborhoods like Logan Square and Pilsen unaffordable for middle income residents. What are you going to do to prevent longtime 36 ward residents from getting priced out of our homes? And what are you going to do to ensure that four, eight, and 10 unit condominiums don't start appearing on blocks that are traditionally reserved for single family homes? Two minutes. Start with Omar. Well, um, I believe gentrification is, a, is, is certainly an issue, especially when you look at Belmont, Creighton, and the Hermosa area. Um, we want to make sure that if we do have development, especially with housing development, throughout any part of the 36 ward, that there's a conversation with the residents in that ward. Um, we want to make sure that people aren't priced out absolutely from, from, the, from their homes, from, their, uh, from where they live currently, and so that, you know, that all of a sudden uh, rental rates and other things start uh, shooting up. 
And so what I would say is that we need to make sure that there's legislation and that we have an alderman there that will uh, make sure that if there is any development, specifically with housing, that we have set aside um, for mixed income housing, ensuring that, that people that live currently in our community are able to still look forward uh, to live there. And we certainly want to make sure that we have resources and services and growth in, in the 36 ward always, but we want to make sure that we're not just pushing people out and not being able to live their lives and uh, you know, raise their families in, in, in the communities. So specifically, I would say this is a, a biggest issue if you look at Belmont Creek and Hermosa. We, well, we want to make sure that as these new developments uh, come about that the community is engaged. Uh, I plan to have a development committee in my office made up of residents of the 36th Ward. I'm going to be very transparent as it relates to the developments uh, for the 36th Ward. I want to make sure that we have affordable housing. I want to make sure that there's a certain percentage that's set aside for these affordable housing units. Uh, I want to make sure, that, again, communication. We're communicating with the community what the plans are. I want to make sure that there's parking, adequate parking for any development that occurs. But again, the key to development and making sure that uh, uh, there's no gentrification or it's, it's limited is making it's communication. Communicating to the residents about the projects that are on the horizon and making sure that they understand what the vision is for the 36th Ward. But again, everyone in, no one out. What specific actions are you going to take as alternate to make sure that all of the schools in the ward, public charter and faith-based, improve during your four years in office? Two minutes, Gilbert. What specific actions are you going to take as alternate to make sure that all of the schools <coughs> in the ward, public charter and faith-based, improve during your four years in office? Again, so I want to make sure that again, the neighborhood schools have the resources they need. Uh, I want to utilize my office. Uh, not just as a service office, but also uh, while, we're, while we're trying to get a community center up to talk about mentoring and tutoring, I want to make sure that my office in the interim uh, provides those types of services so that those kids that are challenging, uh, are challenging have challenges in school, have, a, so have some place to go so that we, again, we can mentor them and tutor them because I want to make sure that, that the neighborhood schools are getting the resources they need. I want to make sure that the other schools, whether it be charter or private, are living up because, again, Charter schools are receiving public dollars. We want to make sure that as taxpayers, we're getting a good return on our investment, and we want to make sure that we're holding them accountable. Uh, my office is going to be open. It's going to be, it's going to be an awesome office. Uh, we're going to be working real close with the community. So again, uh, I look forward to uh, making sure that these kids have the necessary resources, and so uh, that's what, how my office is going to be. <coughs> Simply, uh, I would create advisory councils, and that's what I have an experience in, not only in the state, but on the federal uh, side. Um, I would say I would, one of the first things is creating an education advisory council that we make sure that administrators, teachers, parents, all those perspectives are taken into account when, when discussing things, especially trying to move ordinances forward uh, in the city council and making sure that we have the adequate resources available uh, in our schools. Um, Another council, uh, advisory council I would be creating is a youth advisory council. And I believe it's very important to get our youth uh, mobilized, have, the, have their perspectives heard as well, even if they're of age to vote or not, because they have a perspective as well uh, as a student in a school to, uh, to uh, voice uh, and have a voice of saying what their needs are as well. And so I would have an open line of communication with, with my schools, with the administration, with the teachers and so forth. I'll be visiting the schools often. And so we would always make sure that we are taking uh, the professionals and educators' points of views and making sure that we are providing them the, the adequate resources necessary to have a, a um, you know, providing a great education to our students. Um, and I would just hyper-locally just say that one of the things that I would uh, certainly uh, am committed to doing is specifically at Hanson Park, uh, they need, uh, they need, they're working on trying to have reasonable class sizes, and that's what we're trying to accomplish throughout the city in the 36 ward. So, I, I would try to find, um, generate you know, dollars for them, either through the state, uh, county, private donations, whatnot, uh, to make sure that they have uh, the, the spaces available uh, to make sure that we have adequate, uh, reasonable classroom sizes there. There's a big homeless population, both veteran and non veterans, in the ward. As Alderman, what are you going to do to provide resources for those residents that are most in need of assistance? One minute, Omar. 
we certainly need to make sure that we are um, um, having, we provide um, um, living facilities and, and so forth, and resources and services, not only for veterans, but for all, all homeless. Uh, there's a, a big population of homelessness for, that, are, that are veterans. There's also many of the LGBT uh, community that are, are, are homeless as well. So we wanna make sure that we have um, housing opportunities and, and growth um, development here in the 36th Ward. Um, I believe we need more senior uh, housing as well here in the 36th Ward to make sure that there isn't a senior that ever feels that they are being pushed out of their home and are un unable to live here in the community. Um, so we would be looking for, you know, trying to find, to find re uh, adequate money to bring to our community. We have to make sure that we're uh, working on our city's budget to make sure that we have a, a set aside money for, for housing projects. This is something that's very, that's very uh, close to my heart. Um, as a veteran, it uh, breaks my heart when you see a homeless veteran. Um, and that's why I'm on the All Chicago Board, which is a board that uh, combats homelessness. Uh, President Obama uh, made a pledge in 2015 to end homelessness for veterans. And so there's some federal programs uh, that are available. Uh, as Alderman, I will take a look and work with uh, my federal partners uh, to kind of find out what are some of these dollars that are available to look at try to identify some of the developers that may be doing some of these projects and try to recruit them to the, recruit them to the 36th Ward. Uh, I also want to make sure that these uh, seniors are, are uh, have uh, these senior home residents that are available. Um, but I want to make sure that we're working with our federal partners and trying to identify HUD money uh, as well as money from the Veteran Affairs. We have a budget problem to fix. What are some of your solutions to fix the budget gaps that Chicago currently faces and would you vote to raise property taxes? Two minutes, Gilbert. So uh, the answer for me is no on property taxes. Um, there's a bunch of other items that we can take a look at. Uh, we can take a look at TIF reform. We can take a look at uh, potentially a casino for uh, Chicago. Uh, but the bigger picture is, is uh, not here in Chicago, but actually being dealt in Springfield. It's called the Fair Tax Bill. Uh, Illinois is one of the four states uh, that does not have a graduated income tax. And as a Chicago alderman, I will be down in Springfield advocating for the city of Chicago to bring additional revenues that would be generated from a graduated income tax. Uh, the city of Chicago, uh, we are a donor city. Um, we pay 55 cents on the motor fuel tax, uh, and we only receive 45 cents back on the dollar. So there's a dime that we're leaving uh, down in Springfield. And when you take a look at that, that adds up to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, also, income tax, right now, uh, we're receiving 80 to 90 cents on the dollar. We're leaving 20 cents to 10, 10 cents uh, down in Springfield. We need to make sure that every dollar we pay income tax that we're advocating as a city, we get that dollar back. Those dollars will then free up some additional revenue that we can take a look at earmarking towards paying down our debt uh, or, or uh, taking a look at dedicating it somewhere to pay down some of this pension. Um, and again, I'm against raising property taxes. Uh, the middle class has been hit too hard. The fair tax bill would uh, affect those that make 167,500, and those that make under 50,000 would see a tax cut. So the 50,000 to 164, not, uh, 164 and 999 would pay uh, the 3.75 current rate that we're doing now, and then those that make 167.5 would see their income tax uh, generally uh, go up. I think that's the fair thing to do, and that's why it's called the fair tax bill. So as a city alderman, I'll make sure that we're down in Springfield advocating to make sure that we're leveling the playing field and, and advocating for the city of Chicago to capture as many dollars as possible. Um, in terms of the issue of our city's budget, this is the biggest issue that our city is, is facing right now, and it's because of the pension liability that we're currently in. Um, I have an idea, I've, I've proposed several things and it's been part of my platform. I, I agree, I believe we should have a Chicago casino, do tip reform, have a, a possibly a LaSalle Street tax and possibly even a commuter tax. We have to be open to generating uh, revenue in this city. The problem here in the city of Chicago and in the state and arguably throughout this country is that the way we generate revenue at the moment and we tax people has been very inequitable. Those that can afford to pay more are not paying as much as they, sh they should, and those that can't are working class families and middle class families, specifically those that live in communities like that in the 36th Ward, are feeling the burden of, of the 
these, uh, these revenues. And so I have an idea of called the progressive tax swap. It would be swapping out a certain amount of money from progressive fines and fees to a nominal increase in the property tax, uh, 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 in the property tax. So the, basically, it's if you take a working class uh, home or property in, in the ward, about $250,000 worth, you would say it's increased it by $50 a year, but offset it by regressive fees like uh, cell phone taxes, gas tax, and other, and, and city sticker fees and so forth, offset that amount. And then so the person that has a property that about $250,000, $300,000 property will see a, a reduction in the overall tax they pay to the city, but those that can't afford it, like in the Lincoln Parks of the world, the Streeterville, someone that owns a condo downtown is worth millions of dollars, that increase would be substantial in the, in the city. So what you see is we generate more revenue, but not on the backs of working class families. They will see an overall reduction. And I will only vote for that increase if we can, see, if we can do a plan like this will has an overall reduction of, of, of our working class and uh, families, specifically in the 36th ward. Thank you. Could you state concrete ways in which you will make sure that the 36th Ward supports the inclusion and protection of the rights of LGBTQ families and community? One minute, one mark. So first and foremost, uh, I had, I believe, I don't know if I was the only one, I don't know if Alonzo had also um, uh, submitted a questionnaire and endorsement for the uh, Windy City Times, but I did receive an A rating. And so we want to make sure that our LGBT um, community members, our neighbors, our, the residents here, businesses and so forth, and so forth uh, feel included in the community, feel that they're being treated equal, and our office will be open uh, for them just as they open for anyone else. And so in terms of uh, specific issues, if, if we're talking about what we want to do with after school programs and education, we want to make sure that we're working on bullying issues uh, in our school, we're working on the homelessness issues that affect the LGBT community greatly. But at the end of the day, our office will be treating them, be, uh, treating uh, gay and lesbian families and people uh, and business owners the same way. We want to make sure that they feel included in our community. They are a part of our community. Many of our, uh, many of the people that have knocked on some of their doors, some of the people that have knocked on their doors, are uh, members of these communities, and we want to make sure that they feel uh, um, uh, that they're being taken care of as well. Could you say concrete ways in which you will make sure that the 36 Ward supports? The inclusion and protection of the rights of LGBTQ families and community. Yes, our, our office is going to, again, welcome everyone. This is a community. The 36 Ward is going to be open to everyone. We want to make sure that we're uh, respecting everyone. We want to make sure that we're working with everyone's issues. Uh, I've even I've even bantered the idea of, of making a rainbow flag for Gilbert Villegas for 36 Ward, uh, but I was uh, uh, shot down on that. Um, but again, the community is, is, is going to be, our, our, the community is open. Uh, our office is going to be very receptive to everyone. Everyone's a taxpayer. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone's getting the services that they deserve. Uh, and so my office is definitely going to be um, uh, receptive uh, to the L LGBT community. We need more businesses in the ward along our main streets. What do you plan to do to make sure that our empty storefronts are filled? And how will you work with the community to ensure that those new businesses are a good fit for our community. Two minutes, Gilbert. Okay, well, as a small business owner, this is something that I definitely um, understand. And we take a look at the 36th Ward. We have a Grand uh, Avenue corridor uh, where I plan to work closely with the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic, Economic Opportunity to identify enter enterprise zones. Uh, I'm going to work closely with the federal government to take a look at hub zones, try to recruit uh, business light manufacturing along that corridor. Again, I've already been working closely with the Illinois Chamber of Commerce as well as the Chicago Med Chamber of Commerce and World Business Chicago to identify those corporations that are looking to move to uh, Chicago and then more specifically uh, looking for uh, areas that have a lot of real estate. And so the 36 Ward is prime for that light, that light manufacturing. Um, then we take a look at Fullerton Avenue where we have about 50,000 vehicles uh, that travel up and down uh, Fullerton Avenue. And I want to make sure that, again, that we're engaging the community, talk about some of the opportunities that they would like to see. Uh, I know when I go to uh, get, you know, go get a, go watch a, a soccer game or a football game, that I have to travel sometimes to Division and Dana to some, some of those nice facilities. Well, I, and I see my neighbors there. So I, I'm, I'm sure that they would like to not travel all the way down to Division and Dana. So I want to work with them in the community uh, and talk about some of the ideas that they would like to see come to the 36th floor. 
again, by forming a, a small business committee uh, that would work closely with uh, Chicago Land Chamber, uh, as well as World Business Chicago to talk about uh, some of the uh, companies that want to move to the city of Chicago. And more specifically, I would be a big advocate for recruiting companies uh, to 36 Ward, uh, given the fact that I, I have a, a lot of relationships in, in the corporate world. I want to make sure that I'm recruiting them, talking to them, and pitching uh, the 36 Ward as a place where it's business friendly. Uh, I want, my office is going to be a uh, business incubator to make sure that, again, those businesses that are looking to open up in the 36 Ward are, are not uh, bogged down by the bureaucracy from the city of Chicago. Just a few things. Um, in terms of if, if the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce was interested in the 36 Ward on the Northwest side, they would have had uh, businesses here and, and trying to advocate for us already. So I don't think that's going to necessarily happen. But we should be working with our local chambers, especially, as those are the small business owners of our community, and to making sure that there are the right incentives available, not only to entice uh, entrepreneurs to our, 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 our ward and our communities, but also um, to be able to make sure that those that are here can stay here. I, I currently have our, our, our an office on Belmont and Narragansett, and across the street there's about four vacant storefronts. The, the building that we're using it used to be a double storefront that was empty for about two years. Just two doors out from us is another empty storefront. So this is an issue that is plaguing our, our ward. We do have the Brickyard, which is great. They put tip money there to reinvent the, the Brickyard, and it's great that there's thriving businesses there. But we want to make sure that there are thriving small businesses here in the community. And so we, one of the things is I've talked about having advisory uh, committees, and I think this is very important because you want to have an open dialogue with the community. And so we would have an advisory economic development uh, 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 committee so that we are talking to small business owners and chambers and so forth within the uh, 36 Ward, that we have public meetings when there is talks about public de uh, development uh, and bringing businesses uh, into the ward. Not all businesses are the same. Um, we have actually heard that in certain portions of the ward, uh, there are uh, previous aldermen that are trying to sneak in certain businesses that I believe some people would have questionable, um, would not want necessarily those businesses here in the 36 Ward. And so we need to make sure that we are having a discussion with our, our neighbors and make sure we're bringing in businesses and business owners that are going to be contributors to our community, not just have any type of businesses, pawn shops and the others that are popping up in the 36 Ward. What is your policy on accepting campaign donations from companies, lobbyists, or individuals with pending business before the city council or city council committees? How are you going to ensure that an individual resident is treated just as fairly as a campaign donor is treated? Two minutes only. Quite simply, um, I do not owe, uh, if someone contributes to the, this campaign, we do not owe them anything. They are contributing to our campaign, and those, that especially even volunteers and things like that, I've told everyone, we do not owe anyone anything. This is a this is a, a, a this is a, a campaign to to serve the public in the 36th ward, and so everyone will be treated equally. Residents, especially, I mean, they live in the community, but we also need to make sure that we uh, have an open uh, dialogue with our, our businesses as well. These are this is part of the community. Uh, we need to make sure that we're treating everyone equally. Um, in terms of, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? What is your policy on accepting campaign donations from companies, lobbyists, or the, the policy is very simple. We, uh, we uh, abide by con campaign finance laws. Uh, unlike Gilbert here, who has skirted around those campaign finance laws several times, uh, right now, anyone that has a, a, any business owner that has a contract with the city can at most give you $1,500. Um, his friends, um, who are contractors, have developed a pack so that they can give him 10 times that amount, twice. So they are trying to skirt around campaign finance laws. It's not even just a policy, it is a law. Um, we are just abiding by the campaign finance laws set by the state and the federal government. So when you hear Omar say he says trying to skirt around, so that means that the contributors that are trying to support my campaign are following the law. They're, not, they're, they're following the law. Um, Again, that's their, that's their First Amendment right to support uh, any candidate they choose. We follow all campaign finance reforms, because if we didn't, the Illinois State Board of, uh, of, of Elections would be at our door, uh, you know, writing us up for some violations. So again, uh, unlike my uh, opponent, who uh, just received 
And you heard him talk skirt around the fact that he wants to talk about property tax. He's going to raise your property taxes. Uh, and as a result, uh, $20,000 from property tax attorneys, uh, $20,000 from the vice mayor, uh, Ray Suarez. And he talks about he doesn't owe anyone anything. He's going to owe. Uh, he just hasn't seen the bill yet. Um, but, but, but let me just say this. Um, we got $30,000 from we, Mr. Arroyo. We, uh, right there. So we, the money doesn't travel too far we, there. We, um, Can you repeat the question? That was a loan. Yeah, we. Arroyo was a loan. The precincts on the north. What is your so, policy on accepting campaign yeah. donations from companies? So, again, I work for the taxpayers of the 36th Ward. And so they will be, um, first and foremost, um, represented by myself. Uh, I want to make sure that, again, they have a voice. You're going to have a voice uh, when uh, I'm, I'm the alderman of the 36th Ward. Campaign donors, um, they're allowed legally to contribute. But again, I was asked by the campaign finance reform to talk about, um, about the issues related to campaign finance reform. I think that we should follow New York's model and have a, a small match, a small match in donor program so that way we can get uh, these large contributors out of, uh, out of politics. But the reality is, is that those are the law. Those are the laws that the state of Illinois has uh, passed. And as a result, we're, we're following the law and we're going to continue to follow the law. The precincts on the north end of the ward average around 300 voters, and the precincts on the south end of, of only average around 100 or so. How will you ensure that many money is fairly distributed to all areas, areas of the ward based on need and not based solely on voting patterns? One minute, Gilbert. So I've been saying from the, get, from the get go, I'm, I'm for what's called participatory budgeting. The way that I've divided the map, you have a north section, a western section, and a southern section. That participatory budgeting committee will have two members from each portion of the ward, and they will have equal voting powers. Uh, a million dollars of that 1.3 million will be decided by the community how we spend it. The other 300,000 will be set aside for contingencies in case there's any overruns. But we will also make sure that, again, in case some of these programs or some of these projects don't make the list, we have some additional funding there. But again, I'm for what's called participatory budgeting. This is, these, this is your taxpayers. This is your, this is your taxpayer dollar. We want to make sure that you have a say in how these dollars are expended. So I'm for participatory budgeting. I'm looking forward to working with UIC to develop it. And again, democracy is a good thing. Participatory, participatory budgeting is a farce. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's something that has been tried and has not worked. Uh, and, and you look at the voting patterns alone. Um, when people are more active in their community, they're able to, to be participate in some of the, 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 the excuse me, the meetings and, and, and do out the surveys and things like that. So if there is a portion of the ward that isn't able to do that, uh, then they're not gonna get the, those services. So if I live in the southern portion of the ward that hasn't been receiving much services uh, throughout, we would wanna make sure that we have an open discussion with all communities and with community groups and advisory committees. We're gonna have public meetings when dis uh, deciding uh, what to use uh, our discretionary funds in. But to say that participatory budgeting is going to uh, represent anyone more equally, that's just a lie. You plan on also running for 36 ward committeeman. One minute, Omar. If elected, absolutely. And the reason is just because of what was just discussed earlier with the voting patterns. Uh, unfortunately, in the 36 ward, there are certain precincts and portions of the ward that, especially when, when it has to do with communities that are working class families, um, for some reason, they do not participate as much uh, in the democratic process of, of voting. And so I believe that is the, the job of the democratic commitment to work on. I wanna work on, on that, I wanna, I, I'm a young guy, I wanna be able to, to reach out to the youth and talk about why it's important to be involved in your community, be involved in the democratic process. And not only, it's, it's so discouraging that we see so many people that are uh, um, eligible to vote and that have actively registered, but yet, very few actually go and do their democratic duty and, and, and vote. And so, I would, I, if elected, I certainly would be running for, uh, for committee. My answer is yes, I'll definitely be running for a committee. Uh, again, I wanna make sure that the residents of the 36th Ward understand the political process. 20,000 people, a little under 20,000 people are registered to vote. We saw about 7,000 come out to vote. And so we want to make sure that we're educating the public about the political process. We want to make sure that we're reaching out to everyone. <coughs> Remember, the, the Democratic Commitment also has 
a say in how these judicial, these judges are selected. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're encouraging diversity uh, on the bench. We want to make sure that we're encouraging diversity uh, throughout the city of Chicago. So yes, I will be running for uh, Democratic committee as well. Currently, safe passage routes are planned out and drawn by CPS officials that don't live in the area. How are you going to ensure that principals, LSCs, and the community are more involved in the safe passage process to ensure that those workers are placed in the locations that best maximize safety? One minute, Gilbert. Right, so I, I um, found this out. I'm on the uh, Spinex Local School Council uh, as, a, as a community representative for the LSC, and so um, I have been working with uh, the Chief of Security, uh, J.D. Chow, uh, as well as uh, the 25th Commander, uh, Ms. Benya, uh, to take a look at uh, increasing some safe passages for, for the uh, 36th Ward. Uh, but uh, Alonzo, you are correct that this, this, uh, this decision is made at the CPS level. And so again, working with uh, Mrs. Chow, we've talked about some of the issues and some of the violence that has been occurring uh, in the 36th Ward on the Northwest side. And we wanna make sure that uh, they understand that I'm gonna be an advocate for making sure that our children uh, are going to the schools and they feel safe. When dealing with safe passage, we don't want to just have it to be a term, but actually something that's real. And so I will be working uh, diligently with our administrators and our LSCs to make sure that they have a true voice with CPS and that CPS isn't trying to do some top-down approach of, of how to tell uh, our community members how it's more safe for them to you know, put people wherever they please. Uh, we want to make sure that the administrators and parents that know the community are the ones that can determine where uh, these these routes are, are, are being traveled by our students and where to place those safe passage uh, workers. And so we also be working diligently with uh, the commanders in the 25th and 16th districts to also make sure that there's policing uh, as well in, in, in those areas. Many ward residents want to get involved in the community and have a say in what our taxpayer money is spent on. Outside of a political organization, what will you do to ensure that all residents, both young and old, have a real say and are involved in the civic process. Two minutes, Omar. Yeah, I believe this is uh, exceptionally important in, in the 36 wars, specifically even now because of the fact that, you know, when you create these maps, uh, or when those powers that be that create these maps, um, they don't take community uh, into account. So actually one of the, the uh, forms that we were at previous to this was actually the Amosa community, which is broken down into, I believe, four different wards. And so we want to make sure that, like I said, part of my proposal is having advisory uh, councils and committees uh, so that everyone in the 36th Ward is able to participate, uh, no matter if they supported me or not. If it, and that has no matter because we are there to represent everyone in our community. So I have actually already reached out to the, uh, the gentlemen that, that were in this range previously, Alonzo uh, and, and Chris Vittorio, who were two gentlemen that you know, wanted to, to see some changes and, and actively work in their community. And I said, if elected, our doors would certainly be open uh, uh, to you. I would love to partner with you because you have a passion for our community, as do I, and I wanna make sure that we are all uh, working together to push our community forward. And so with that said, actually Chris Victorio has already endorsed my campaign, and so I'm looking forward to working with him for years to come. And, and I still, uh, the offer is still there to Alonzo. I look forward to working with him in the future as well, as we are neighbors, and so I know he's a passionate person about the, the community here, uh, not only in the 36th Ward, but really on the Northwest side. So an another thing is that I would wanna work with, uh, you know, businesses and, and other organizations that not necessarily uh, work just in the 36th Ward, but in other areas that are neighboring. So the other wards um, um, that cover the same communities that the 36th Ward Many ward residents want to get involved in the community and have a say on what our taxpayer money is spent on. Outside of a political organization, what will you do to ensure that all residents, both young and old, have a real say and are involved in the civic process? Right. So this 36th ward race um, has created a lot of groups all of a sudden. So that's good because again, the community wants to get involved. So I want to support and make sure that the, these groups have the necessary funding. I want to make sure that they're, they're aware of some of the public dollars that are available to assist them with some of developing some of the programs. Uh, I want to make sure that we're educating uh, the residents of the 36th Ward about the civic process. Uh, Can you repeat that one more time? 
outside of a political organization, what will you do to ensure that all residents, both young and old, have a real say and are involved in the civic process? Yeah. Um, you also mentioned about tax funds, right? Yeah, right, so again, participatory budgeting uh, is something that is very important. The way that, the way that UIC, I've been working with UIC uh, to develop the, the, uh, the curriculum uh, is would really put it in a manner where every, both, all three sections have an equal voting power uh, and they have a say in how the menu money uh, will be spent in the 36th Ward. Again, this is their tax dollars. I want to make sure that they understand this is the most democratic process to allow the residents, the taxpayers of the 36th Ward, to have a say in how their taxpayers, tax, how their dollars are going to be spent in the 36th Ward. So again, I'm all for democracy. I'm all for making sure that our office is transparent. I want to make sure that we're inclusive of the community. And so again, participatory budgeting is something that I'm a big fan of. It's not a farce that's being used throughout the whole country. Chicago obviously is behind. We only have four wards that are available, that are working with uh, participatory budgeting, but it's doing very well on the West Coast. The community has lost hundreds of trees over the last few years. What are you gonna do to make sure that those trees are replaced? One minute, Gruber. So um, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that uh, we're talking to those, those neighbors that um, that their trees were cut down, make sure that they do want a tree back there, because a lot of times these roots are causing problems uh, with, their, with their plumbing and their pipes. So we want to make sure that they do want to have that tree replaced. If they don't want to have that tree replaced, I want to make sure that we're doing, we're talking about community gardens. I want to make sure that we're talking about uh, teaching our kids about the environment. I think this would be a good opportunity to talk about the arborist, uh, making sure that they're, they're familiar with that profession, uh, making sure that they understand, again, that the environment is something that we, that we hold sacred. We want to make sure that the kids understand that the environment is very important. Uh, trees has been a, a big, if you knock on doors as much as I have, and you talk to, to the residents in, in the 36th Ward, trees uh, are, are a big thing. Uh, tree trimming, the cutting down of trees, unfortunately, uh, because of the emerald ash borer uh, infestation that occurred on the, uh, in Cook County's northwest side and impacted specifically the northwest side of Chicago especially. Um, but as the city crews are sort of come late to actually trim them and cut them down, they're even uh, more later into actually uh, placing the new trees. We want to make sure that we are working on our budget to have the adequate funding to not only be able to have accessible uh, forestry departments that is responsive not three years or two years behind, but that when you ask for um, something to be either trimmed or cut down, that there is a replacement tree when, uh, when residents want that. And I know that's certainly a very big issue in the 36th Ward. Uh, and I know that because I've talked to a lot of residents here in the Ward that, um, that want to see their trees back in front of their homes. Some of the train lines running along the south end of the Ward are causing damage to the foundations of residents' homes. How do you plan on addressing that? One minute, we'll start with Omar. So we want to make sure that, you know, if we have transportation that's going through our, um, our board, either through, through trains uh, or whatnot, it, it does have an economic boom to our, our, um, our ward and our cities. We, we, we certainly want to have those train lines still there. If they're having uh, an impact negatively in our community, we certainly want to hold those, uh, uh, either the companies, the private companies that are passing through there, with the freight train or if it's Metro and then RTA and whatnot, and hold them accountable and make sure that there's a fund developed uh, for those communities that are negatively impacted uh, with their uh, with their trains passing through the community, but certainly those trains are um, have been always a great development for the 36 Ward, especially industrial, uh, but also with being able to tra uh, be able as transportation routes as well to and from uh, downtown and to the sub suburban area. So uh, the trains are a blessing and a curse. Uh, Chicago is the hub of the nation as it relates to transportation. Six of the class one, you know, the class one railroads are located in the city of Chicago. Uh, again, everything from the west coast to the east coast stops in Chicago. But if it's negatively impacting the residents of 36 Ward and causing issues with uh, causing issues with uh, uh, people's properties, we want to make sure that we're calling in uh, these railroads such as uh, BNSF and Union Pacific and bringing them in to the table to talk about the issues that their trains are causing to our residents. And we want to make sure that they're held accountable. 
uh, as it relates to Metro, we want to make sure again that they're traveling safely through these areas. I know that one of the big issues that I've heard knocking on doors is over there by Narragansett uh, and the uh, and McLean, where uh, the trains are blowing horns at all, to, all hours of the night, and that's something that uh, as soon as I get in, I plan to work with Metro to talk about maybe a quiet zone in that area. Thank you. This will be one minute. Entire streets on the north end and south end of the ward are being worked on simultaneously at, at the same time. And it's making lives harder for residents, parking and whatnot. How will you work with residents to make future construction projects that take up entire length of streets easier to handle? So uh, again, uh, as a former as a deputy director of the Illinois Department of Transportation, the utilities, we need to make sure that they're communicating with, with CDOT, we need to make sure and again, that there's some planning that's going on. What, what, ha what, what happens a lot and drives me crazy is when you'll see a street paved, and then uh, maybe a couple of days later, the utility company's coming in and cutting up, and then all of a sudden uh, making the repairs when, when it was open prior to, the, uh, prior to uh, laying down the asphalt. Um, they could have easily accessed uh, that repair right there, but again, there's no communication. So we wanna make sure that the utilities, we wanna make sure that the community uh, um, is, is made aware of the issues. Uh, we want to also make sure that the utilities are giving us, our office, enough notice so that way we can spread the word to the residents uh, that there's some issues coming up. We want to make sure that CDOT uh, is communicating with our office so that way, again, we can in turn communicate with the, with the community that uh, these types of projects will be going on so that way they can uh, make some adjustments. And Alonso, I apologize, you, you were talking about specifically um, work on, on streets and its impact on parking, you were saying. Uh, uh, yeah, if you look at the 54 to 5900 mm -hmm. lap of West Henderson and also down here That's by right. Dickens, yeah. um, entire streets are being worked on Absolutely. at the same time with okay. no notice. To yeah, absolutely. Uh, as it comes to that, actually, it's ironic that you asked that question as we received a phone call just last week on, on that issue alone. And so it's the, the major thing is communication. Uh, having open communication with the residents in your ward and also with the uh, those that are doing some sort of you know work in the ward. Sometimes it could be CDOT in certain areas right now, uh, it's people's gas. And what people get frustrated with mostly is that they don't know which direction things are going in. Um, they don't know the timetable behind the work that's being done. They don't know the purpose of some of the work sometimes. And so it's able to have a office that is able to work with all these entities and communicate to the residents in the ward and let them know how long they should be expected to work and so forth. The problem is that um, if you ask some of these people that work uh, for People's Gas specifically, they are um, hired out, um, um, contracted out workers that come from Wisconsin that quite honestly do not know how long they're gonna be in the, uh, the area that they're working in at the time. So it's being able to, to translate that, that, uh, that message to our residents. Pastor Floyd has the final question of the night. I wanted to ask just a simple question. We always talk, and we talk about debates and politics, and you hear all the time uh, the separation of church and politics, if you will. Um, in our neighborhoods, I think that our neighborhood is founded on church ethics. Um, what are you going to do to bring back that community awareness of God and togetherness? Does that make sense? I believe I, believe I understand your questioning. And so there is a separation of church and state for the most part. Um, but I don't, I believe though that the church like our schools and other community centers in, in, in the community have much more purpose uh, than just uh, serving as just church and whatnot, but you are also an active member of this community. Uh, and so one of the things that um, I propose is that I would love that our office to not only work, you know, to work with you, to work with the other churches that are nearby in this community. Uh, one of the things that we did is that I was, um, Someone reached out to me because of my spirit, specifically with the Congresswoman's office, and it was called uh, the Korean American uh, Friendship Network, and they had a, a donation that was given. They do this in several cities, several times, uh, once a year during the holidays, and they give out a certain amount of coats, and these are coat drive, and they asked Omar, uh, we'd like to do this on the Northwest side, so we've partnered with several of the churches in doing things like that and, and having this coat drive. 
in, 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 the, in the Northwest side. So it's working on things like that and also seeing that if we can partner together and having it, there's a resident in the community that needs some assistance knowing that you all will be Second. available to help as well. So uh, churches are a very important part of the 36th Ward. Um, again, the separation of church and state. But again, when those issues come up, um, what I do is I advise the churches that again, they should have maybe a not-for-profit section, a 501c3, because there's a lot of times when the churches are providing services for the community, but again, they're not able to provide as many services as possible because again, their funds are limited. So I, I, edu I educate uh, the churches in the 36th Ward and talk to them about you know, maybe having a not-for-profit arm um, because again, a lot of people come to the community, they come to their church um, because again, those are anchors in the community. And I wanna make sure that they're well aware of the, the public dollars that are available because the services that they provide are invaluable. All right, thank you again, Pastor Floyd, for being so helpful in this process. On the back of your agenda, you will all find information on how to join the Belmont Prayer Community Organization on Facebook. We will, have, we will be having many events this coming summer, and we hope you can be a part of it. We would also like to thank Omar Aquino and Gilbert Villegas for attending tonight's forum. And please don't forget uh, to vote on Election Day on April 7th, and please give the two candidates a round of applause.